RabbitMQ is a powerful message broker that can help you create resilient and scalable applications. If you're not familiar with the message broker, don't worry. By the end of this video, you'll have a clear understanding of what they are and why they're useful. In this video, I'll explain the basics of message brokers, I'll demonstrate how RabbitMQ can be used with C-sharp applications, and I'll provide tips for setting it up effectively. Whether you're building a microservice or simply looking to improve the reliability and scalability of your application, this video will be a valuable resource for you. Before we dive in, I want to share a few things with you. First, if you're interested in improving your C-sharp skills, be sure to subscribe to this channel. With over 500 C-sharp videos and counting, it's the perfect place to learn and grow your skills. Second, if you're looking for free C-sharp resources, head over to www.imtimcorey.com and check out the resources tab. You'll find my podcast, the C-sharp projects page, and much more. Third, if you're ready for a deeper dive into a specific C-sharp topic, I have a variety of courses that can help. Not only will you receive a world-class education, but you'll also help fund my free content so that everyone can have a great education in C-sharp, not just those who can afford it. Now, let's get started in a little bit different manner this today. So we're going to start with this diagram. This represents a traditional application, okay? So we've got over here on the left, we have our web application. In the middle, we have our server that, that runs the, the processing of whatever application you want to do. And we have our database that stores our information. Now, let's just say that on the web application here on the left, we're going to uh, do a sign up page. Okay. In a traditional web application, we sign up and we send the data to the server. And then the server does some work and it's going to send that data to the database. The database is going to accept the information. And then once that's all done, the server comes back to the web page and says, hey, we're done. We're good to go. You can move on with life. That's a traditional way of doing things. However, there are some drawbacks, especially in larger applications or applications that need to be more resilient. For instance, what happens if the web server goes down? Well, then the, the website can't do SAPs. And what happens if the database goes down? Well, then the server can't actually store the data. Therefore, the website goes down. So we have here a very synchronous operation, a very um, an operation that relies on every part of the process being up and running. This is a traditional way of doing things. Now, servers don't go down that often. In theory, hopefully, if you write good server code, they don't. But that's what happens. Now, imagine for a minute that we decided, you know what, we're going to have quite a few more of these all doing the same thing. And so they're all hitting the server with their information all at once. Well, what happens if that happens? Maybe, of course, not four, but what if it's 400 or 4,000 or 40,000? Well, all of a sudden, the server gets slow, bogged down. All of a sudden, it crashes, which means that these pages don't actually work. The sign-up fails. This is a, a scalability issue. This is where we say, hey, we've overloaded the server. We have to put more resources towards the server and make the server bigger and have a faster internet connection and have you know, more RAM in it and faster hard drives. But that only goes so far. And it still relies on the server being available. So let's redo this scenario and let's get rid of a few of these. And we'll scale back down to one web application for now. And we're going to change things up a bit and talk about message brokers. So a message broker is a way of the, the big picture overview is think of it like an email server. So let's put a few things in place. We're going to pretend we're going to use an Azure function for the kind of the, um, the back end for this web, web application. So when we want to do a sign up, we tell the web App or the Azure function, hey, here's the information for the setup page. Okay. So now you'd think, well, then the Azure function would talk to the server, right? No, that's where we have a little bit different setup. I'm just going to draw this in here. I didn't find a good uh, diagram for this, but I think this works. So we're just going to draw this box here, and this is our message broker. So what happens is the Azure function will then send a message to the message broker, and it will look kind of like an email. Now it's not an email, but it looks kind of like that. So it's a little message 
that it sends and it puts it into the message broker and what's called a queue. So the, uh, the broker will say, okay, I've got the email and now the Azure function can say, hey, you know what? Web page, we're done. That's it, okay? And you can go on about your merry way because for all you know, that things are on their way, they're processed. And the reality is all the work is done on the server. So no work has been done yet on their data. But as far as the setup page is concerned, we're good to go, we can move on, which means you can have lots more of these hitting this, the Azure function at once because of the fact they're not doing any real work. There's no wait for the database. There's no uh, doing processing or any kind of business logic on the on the code or on the, on the data. It's just saying, hey, I've got the data. I created a message and I sent it on to the, the message broker. That's all I did. So that's a lot more scalable already. Now, the message broker says, hey, you know what? I have these different uh, queues. So I'm gonna, there's one queue that this goes in because it's based on what type of message it is. It says, I'll put this in a queue. And by the way, that server, it's listening for this email. So, or this message. So it's gonna send this message to the server. The server is going to do the normal processing. It's gonna put information in the database and it's going to tell the queue, yes, I fully processed that message. And then the message goes away, okay? That's the, the process of a message broker. Now you may look at that and go, wow, Tim, you just made things more complicated. Why would you ever do this? Well, here's why. First of all, we've already got scalability improvements because this Azure function is not really doing anything. Like, that doesn't have to be a function. It can be a, a full application. It can be whatever you want, but it's just a small application usually that says, hey, cool, I've got the information. I'm going to put it into the queue. That's all it does. Could be an API. So that's not a lot of work, which means it's a lot more scalable with these messages. Now, imagine for a minute, the message is in the queue, but for whatever reason, the server is unavailable. Guess what happens? This message just sits here and it sits here and it sits here. And maybe we're, we're down for a day, maybe two days. The, the server is not working for whatever reason. We put some bad code on it. We're working on getting it fixed. And we finally get it fixed and we put the server back in place. And the server says, hey, I'm back online. And the queue says, oh, goody, I've got something for you to process. And it processes that information and it tells the queue, yeah, we're good. I took care of that message. Now, in reality, it probably wouldn't be just one message. It'd probably be hundreds of messages. Not a problem. They can just sit here into the queue until the server is ready. That means we're much more resilient when it comes to an outage of the server. Now imagine for a minute that we have a lot more of these, okay? We've, we've got a lot more people trying to send in information. We have a lot more messages and let's just duplicate this once. We're not gonna make it crazy in here. We've got lots of messages coming in and the server gets overloaded. Well, not a problem because you can duplicate your server, have two servers. And this first server gets the first message and the second server gets the second message and they process and they both write to the database. Okay, so now you can, you can have more scalability because these servers aren't directly tied to your front end. They are listening for messages and you can have as many servers as you want listening to messages and doing the work. Now, we do have this reliability issue of the database now. That's a separate discussion when you get into microservices and talk about a database per service or microservice and all the rest. That's a separate conversation. But what we have right now because of a message broker is a disconnect between the front end web application that sends the data and the back end servers that do the processing of the data in the database. This allows us to scale up and out our front end, and it allows us to scale up and out our back end and process these things in whatever speed is needed. So we can have 10, 20, 30, 40 of these servers processing messages if needed. And then when they're no longer needed, we can just get rid of them 
and go back to just having our one. So the message broker is an important role because it's the thing that captures these messages and then puts them in the right queue and alerts the server or the server can pull the queue either way and then sends those messages on to the current server and it listens to make sure that the message has been properly processed because if not it doesn't keep the message sent it actually brings it back and says okay i'll send it to a different server that can process it okay so make sure it's resilient as well in that manner so the message queue message broker is a an important piece in all of this now this right here the message broker is what rabbit mq does rabbit message queue okay so it's one type of queuing system now it uses a a standardized type of message queuing that's also used by Azure Service Bus. So uh, it's called AMQP. So there's other types or standardized versions that um, different service buses use or different um, queues use. And that's okay, you can have different ones, but RabbitMQ allows you to create messages that will be similar to what you'd use in say an Azure Service Bus. Azure Service Bus is another type of message queue or message broker. So we've got lots of different ways of doing this box right here, the message queuing, but today we're gonna to look at RabbitMQ, which is an open source system for doing these types of messages. Okay, got it? So now we're actually gonna look at some code and write some code to first talk to the server as a, a sender, and then we'll create some, which is this right here, the Azure function, that's a sender. And then we're going to write some client code for not just one client, but for two different clients. So we can have double the processing capacity for our queue because we're going to actually kind of overload from a sender side, we're gonna overload that queue so we can actually see how we can bring on more than one processor to handle the load of all the messages, which means we can scale up our application and see that visually. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do now. Okay, let's drag us off the screen and we have opened our Visual Studio, but first I want to actually set up a our, our um, RebMQ server. And I showed this off in a 10 minute training earlier and I want to kind of use that 10 minute training. So if you haven't watched the 10 minute training, this might look like magic, but what we're gonna do is we're going to create a Docker container that, or Docker, yes, a Docker container that is running Rabbit MQ server with the management package attached. So with this, and it's done now, um, with this, now we have, if we open up Docker, we'll see that we have this Rabbit server running. And yes, that's all the time it took was just that because I already had the images downloaded. So if I open up this link right here, it's going to open up my Rabbit MQ server. So this is why I love Docker so much because I just said, hey, you know what? I want a RabbitMQ server installed. And within five seconds, I already had it done. Now, of course, if you're downloading stuff first, sure, go get a coffee, come back, whatever your download speed is, is how long it's gonna take. But this has Erlang installed as well as RabbitMQ, everything set up on a Linux virtual machine or a Linux uh, container, which is like a virtual machine, but not quite. So with this, we now have our, our Rabbit server running. Now, there's a lot of stuff here. The UI is, is okay. You have to understand what's going on to really understand all the different stuff it's showing you. But what we're going to do is focus in on the queues, which we have no queues right now, no queues. But we're going to use C Sharp to create some queues, put some stuff in there, and then use some tools to read that information. So we're gonna do this all in C-sharp, but I wanna get this set up and running so you can see, you know, there's nothing in here. We haven't set anything up yet. We're going to inside of C-sharp. Okay, so let's minimize that. And we're gonna create a new project. Let's create a console application. So we'll call this the uh, rabbit server, uh, rabbit sender. How about that? That's a little better because we're going to uh, create both a sender and a couple of receivers. So 
let's call this rabbit MQ demo, like so. And .NET 7 and create. So the first thing we have to do is we have to go in here and get rid of all this code. And we'll say dependencies, add a NuGet package. And we're going to search for not under install, but under browse. RabbitMQ. And we see rabbitmq.client. So this is the latest version is 6.4.0. And this is what we want to install. It's rabbitmq.client. We'll use this for all of our uh, projects. So we hit OK. And now it's installed. We're good to go. And now in here, we're going to add a using rabbitmq.client and also using system.txt, I believe I'll need. Um, so what we're going to do first, we're going to set up a connection. Connection factory equals new. And then factory.uri equals new URI. This is a uh, uniform resource indicator, which is essentially, we can think of it as a URL, which is a uniform resource locator. Yes, they're slightly different, but um, all URLs are URIs. How about that? So what we got to do is give it a, um, a URI or a URL. And what is that URL? Well, it starts off with the protocol AMQP colon slash slash, and then we're going to give it both the username and the password to log in. Now, what is the username and password? Well, if we log out here and log back in, guest, guest, there you go. That's the default for the RabbitMQ management system. So we say over here, guest colon guest. And you're saying, Tim, you're putting a connection string right in the source code. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Because I wanted to use console applications, but I don't want to go into the depth of showing off how to use a um, app settings.json, which is the recommended way of doing this. But I have shown a video, the uh, perfect console application video. I showed how to do your um, app settings.json in your console application. I recommend you doing that. It's just kind of outside the scope of this video. So this should all come from a app settings.json file, actually your secrets.json file. And then when you publish it, you can pull it from Azure Key Vault or somewhere else. So guest colon guest at localhost colon 5672. Now, where did I get the 5672? Well, if you open up Docker again and look, 5672, if you can see that right there, um, that is the uh, port for sending queue messages to the server. Now, internally, it's 5672, so I mapped it externally to the same, whereas up here, the uh, the web server is normally at 15672, but I mapped port 8080 because it was just easier. So 5672 is the port we're looking for, and that's it. So that's our connection string to our RabbitMQ server to send messages. Next up, we're going to say, sorry, factory dot client provided name equals, and we'll say that this is our uh, rabbit sender app. Now, client provided name is a name you give your application. So I made this up. I said rabbit sender app because this is our rabbit sender application. You get to choose what you, you name this, but it's kind of important that you give it a name. It just makes debugging easier if you have lots of different senders sending messages or clients that are receiving messages. That way you know which one had the problem or which one's sending bad data or whatever. So we now have our factory for our connection. We can say I connection, let's say CNN equals factory dot create connection. We're going to say I model channel equals cnn.create model. This comes from RabbitMQ. This is their interface for setting up a, a channel. And then we're going to capture three different strings. And hold on, I know that this is a lot of just stuff thrown at you, but I want to get you to the point of seeing it in action. 
And then we can do is go back and play with this. Now my source code is available. If you go down in the description, you can download the source code. Um, it actually sends you to a webpage where you put in your name and email address. It will email it to you. Um, and then you can have a source code and play with it on your own instead of retyping what I did. Um, but that way you can kind of change things and see what changes when you make the changes. I find it easier to do that than starting over from scratch because there's a lot of stuff that's, if you're not familiar with, with message queues and with channels and exchanges and routes and all the rest, it can be a bit confusing. So just hang with me as we do this. String, exchange name. And we'll say that is the demo exchange. And we're gonna have string routing key equals demo routing key. So we're making up an exchange. And then string Q name equals demo Q. So there's three pieces of information we're gonna need. The exchange name, which takes a routing key, and then also the Q name. Now if we go back to our RabbitMQ setup, we have exchanges. There's exchanges, there's some that, that come by default. And we also have channels and we have queues. So what we're doing is we're setting up an exchange and a queue. Those are the two things. Then what we'll do is we'll bind our exchange to our queues. So what happens is something comes into the exchange and then goes to the queue that is, is needed. So we're trying to keep it simple. There's a lot more depth you can go into the RabbitMQ. I'm not covering everything. This is an intro video just to get, get you up and running with the basics of how you would use this. So let's say now we're gonna say channel dot exchange declare, exchange name, and then exchange type. Exchange type dot direct. So that's the type of exchange we're using as a direct connection. Next up, we're going to say channel dot Q declare. So we're creating our Q. Q name. We're not going to make this durable. We're not going to make it exclusive. We're not going to have an auto delete. And we're going to have no arguments. Let's unpin this so you can see that. No arguments. This is the nice thing about having these, these tags here. They actually tell you what these variables are. It's really, really helpful. That's part of the, um, the settings that under the tools and options that you can set up. It's really helpful. So now channel dot Q bind. So we're going to bind our exchange and our Q together. We're going to say Q name, exchange name, and routing key. And we're going to say null is the last option for arguments. So we have bound our queue to our exchange. Okay, so here's the routing key to use to send, to route that information. Okay, now that we have all of that kind of set up out of the way, let's create a, a simple sent message. So byte array. We're going to say message body uh, bytes. We'll say encoding dot utf8 dot get bytes for the message hello YouTube. So, what am I doing here? Well, when you send a message through a queue, through exchange into a queue, you send a message to your message broker. What it's going to do is it's going to just send a, a set of bytes, just byte data. And so what we're doing is we're taking our message and we are encoding it as UTF-8 version of bytes. So now we have a byte array of our message. And now we can say channel basic publish exchange name, the routing key, The basic properties is null and the message body bytes. So what we've done now is we've said, hey, we've got a, we're gonna publish in this channel, we're gonna publish, here's the exchange name, which the channel right here is our, our model. Um, so you said, 
use that to publish to our exchange using this routing key. And here is the message to put into our queue. And that's it. We've now just published a message. Let's say channel.close and our connection.close, which if you don't close your channel, that's kind of okay because your connection will close up for you, but best practice is close the, the channel first. So with that, we now have a way to send messages to our RabbitMQ queue. So we now have our exchange. Notice there's our list of exchanges and we have our no list of queues, okay? So let's run this application. And it just says, hey, we're done. Press any key to close, we closed. Now you come back over here and look, we have demo exchange. Whoops, clicked on it. We have demo exchange right here, which is our exchange, which remember we said demo exchange is our exchange name. And then we said, hey, that's connected to the demo queue, which we have one message in our queue. So if we look here, one message in our queue ready to be processed, but nothing's listening on that queue. Therefore, nothing's happened. Our, our message is just, just sitting here. Now you can go into your queue and you can say, hey, I wanna look at that message. But if you look at the message, then what can happen is you can actually essentially delete the message because you looked at it. So the way this works is you only process a message once. So instead of doing that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our queues and look at it and close it or move us back off. And we're gonna say for now, we're gonna pause right here and say, we're done with this sender application. Let's come back over here, pin this back, and we're gonna create a receiver so they can actually receive our messages. So to do that, we're going to right click on the solution. We're going to say, add new project, console application. We're gonna call this rabbit receiver one. Why? Because we're gonna create rabbit receiver two. So that's why. .NET 7, and there we go. Now, if we click on rabbit sender, in the project file, we have this item group with our rabbit MQ.client. I'm gonna copy this. And then I click over here and on our rabbit receiver one, just paste it in. What that will do is we'll add the NuGet package to rabbit receiver. I don't have to go through and find it in NuGet and all the rest. Now, if you notice, I do have different color tabs. I'm using the colored tab right now. Um, what they do is they tell you um, which project they go to based upon the color. The only thing that I've asked for an upgrade to is that right now these colors don't really correspond to anything in Solution Explorer. So yes, they're colored and they're different, but we already knew we, only, we had two different program.cs's and just having different colors, not very helpful. Now for a larger application, absolutely very helpful, but just note that for this demo application, the colors won't be that helpful. Yes, they're different because yes, they're different. So in this case, this is the rabbit receiver. Notice in the right-hand side, it does highlight the file that we're in. So rabbit receiver one, uh, program.cs. So now with this setup, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add our using, using rabbitmq.client and using, whoops, rabbitmq dot client dot events and finally using system dot text so that's our three using statements now this next part is pretty easy because we go over to program.cs and we copy all of this we already whoops come on go away there we go we copy all of this through here because that's the same thing we're going to co connect to the same server we're going to change our client provided app name, but we're going to have the same exchange, the same queue name. We're going to um, bind the same queue and all the rest. So copy this and we can paste it over here. Now let's change our 
thing to say rabbit uh, receiver one app, but we're going to have our um, our connection. We're going to have our model. We're going to have our three uh, our exchange, our routing key, and our queue name strings. We're going to have the same declaration, the queue declaration, and the binding. So it's all the same stuff as before. Now we're going to add one more thing we're going to do. Let's do it uh, right up here. Channel dot basic quality of service. And we're going to set three values here, zero, one, and false. Now, what this is, is the prefetch size. Oh, if you double click that, I didn't even know that. If you double click the, the tag here, then it will actually put the value in there, uh, which is kind of nice. It's kind of nice to actually see that. I just wanted to highlight it, but of course I can't. So the prefetch size, what it says is we don't care how big the, the message is. That's you could limit the size of the messaging or the, the set of messages to a certain size. We're not going to worry about that. But then the prefetch count, what this says is how many messages do you want to have sent to you at once? Remember, we have in our queue just one message. However, there could be hundreds or thousands. Do you want them to all just pile onto this server all at once? Well, the answer is probably not. I prefer to have it process one message at a time. So therefore, we're going to say one. We're going to do one message at a time. Because then if we have more than one receiver applications, we don't send all messages to the first one and then have nothing for the second one to do. Well, the first one backed up and overloaded trying to process all the messages. So this way, we can only send one at a time. And this global right here, what this does, it says, hey, do you want to apply this just to this current instance or to the entire system. And we're just going to apply it just to this instance. Now is where the, the changes come into play. We're going to say channel dot, I'm sorry, var, var consumer equals new eventing basic consumer. We're going to pass in the channel. So we're going to say, hey, we're a consumer here. This is our consumer setup. And we're going to create an event or event handler, I'm sorry, consumer dot received. So when you receive a message, what are you going to do? Well, we're going to add a, a new event handler. We're going to say sender and args. And we'll have our arrow here and we'll create the function right here. Now we could create a separate function and pass it in here instead, but we're just going to create it right in line. Now we're going to say var body equals args dot body to array. We'll say string message equals encoding dot utf8 dot get string from the body. So this is grabs the, the body information, which is a read only memory byte uh, value. We're going to set it to a byte array instead. So now we have this byte array of the body growing. Remember that before we down here created a byte array of the message body bytes from this encoding of hello YouTube. We're doing the opposite now and decoding it. We're getting the string value from this. Now I'm passing a hello world. We're going to talk more about how you pass complex types. That's we're going to get to that. But for now, we're just passing the string. So we got the string. And we'll say console right line and we'll say uh, message received and we'll say the message like so. So there's our message. It's going to pop out on the console as a right line. And then we'll say channel dot basic acknowledge args dot delivery tag. And we're not going to, going to acknowledge multiple messages, just the one. So what we've said is, hey, pass back the delivery tag. So this is what's passed into us. We're going to pass it back saying, yes, this message was delivered properly. Basic acknowledgement of that. So that way, we, what we've said is we've processed this data. Now, just to be clear, once you get out of this, this, um, let's put a semicolon here. Once you get out of this curly brace right here, the received, you don't have that message anymore. So you need to do something with it first. 
So you need to do something in here to grab the message. In this case, we just put it into a string and then print it out. You probably want to save it to a database or you know, send it off to a, um, a method of some kind to do some work on it, whatever it may be. But you want to make sure you do something with the message. Now, if you do something with the message, and let's say you get an exception, maybe the uh, the database is down and you wanted to write it to the database, what you could do is not acknowledge the message and say, actually, we had a failure here. That will mean that the RabbitMQ does not take the message out of the queue. It keeps it in there because it says, hey, that didn't work. It's only when we say we're acknowledging that we've successfully processed the message that it will come out of the queue. Now, we're not quite done yet. Um, let's grab the, um, consumer tag. If I spell it right, string consumer tag equals channel basic consume of the queue name. Auto acknowledge is false and pass in the consumer as well. What this does, it gives the tag for the overall, um, consume system. Okay. Which means that we can cancel this before we do though, console redline. I'll explain why in just a minute, but channel dot basic cancel of consumed consumer tag, and then channel dot close and connection dot close. So this is just making sure that we, we shut down this consumer properly. So we grab a tag from it and say, hey, I want you to cancel or delete the content class consumer. So handle it properly to close that down. And again, close down the channel and close down the connection. Now, why did I put the console read line here? Because we're in a console application, remember that we start on line one. And it reads down through and executes every line. However, once it gets to line 41, it closes down the application. It's done. It's over. But if we have an event listener that's trying to listen for stuff, well, if the application's closed, it can't listen anymore. So what we do is we leave this console running until you hit the enter key. So this will run. And then as we get messages sent in, it's going to process those messages and then it's going to not close down until we hit the enter key, then it will properly close everything down. Let's run just this application and make sure that it works. Set a startup project, run this. Remember we have one message in the queue and we receive message received, hello YouTube. We come back over here and look at our page, it's already refreshed. It refreshes every five seconds, but it says zero ready messages. Let's zoom in here. Zero ready messages, zero total messages, because we've processed all the messages and said, Hey, we've acknowledged that they successfully processed. Therefore it's empty. So we've got the message now on our receiver. Remember that part of the value of this disconnected architecture is the fact that these servers don't have to be running when you put stuff into the queue. And in our case, they weren't. So this, this right here, this console application represents the server side, the, the processor, the thing that receives the messages. It wasn't running when we sent that message off. It wasn't until we turned it on that it then processed the queue with all the messages. So we've now demonstrated the disconnected nature of the send and receive of this system. But I think we can do a little better because, you know, right now we, we are sending and receiving one message at a time, but what if we improve that a bit? So first of all, let's come up here in our receiver before we do anything, we're going to say task dot delay and we'll say time span from seconds five seconds is fine and we're going to say wait what this will do is it's going to pause our application for five seconds before it does something so when it first receives a message it's going to wait five seconds and then do the work this is going to simulate 
a, an application that takes a little bit of time to do some work. It's not, you know, it's not instantaneous that it just says, hello world, and we're good to go. So it's gonna take some work. So let's go ahead and start up, let's uh, start up Project Ascender, and we're gonna launch this. It's run, it's closed already. Let's go over to program.cs and change, um, change to say again, and run it again. And it's already, it processes and closes really quick. So now we have, come over here to RabbitMQ. If you watch, wait for it, wait for it, there we go. And we now have two messages in the queue. Now, if you come back over and right click on receiver and say set as startup project and run the receiver part of it. First of all, notice it's blinking, it's blinking, it's blinking. Wait for it, wait, there we go. Hello, YouTube. But now we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. Hello, YouTube again. So it's processed both of those messages and now it's just waiting for any new messages. So we now have our application working where it's it's simulating a, a slow receiver, one that's doing some type of real work, which is pretty normal. You're doing some kind of work, it's not gonna be instantaneous. Now, it probably shouldn't be five seconds long. That's pretty long in computer time for one receipt, one thing to do, but let's just pretend that's how long it takes. But let's not just, you know, say, hey, that's fine, we'll just do it one-to-one. -one. Let's go to our sender. In our sender, right now we've got this basic publish that publishes one message. Let's uh, cut this out. And instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say four. And let's say I is less than 60. So we're gonna do this 60 times. We're gonna say console right line, and let's make it string interpolation, sending message, and we'll put the, the number in there. So you can see, you know, as it sends it. And then we'll paste in our message, but we're going to say, instead of hello YouTube again, this is going to be um, message number, and we'll put our, our I, whoops, our I there, and we'll put our string interpolation here. So now we're gonna say, hey, this is message one, this is message two, this is message number three, and so on, so you can tell them apart. But again, to simulate the fact that these aren't gonna come in instantaneously, let's say thread.sleep for a, a thousand milliseconds. We'll just do thread.sleep instead of uh, the task.delay. But now we're gonna send up to 60 messages. Well, we are gonna send 60, 60 messages over the course of a minute. But this is only gonna wait one second to process. This takes five seconds to wait per item. Therefore, we're gonna have a backup. We're gonna have lots of these things that we need to, to process. So how are we gonna handle this? Well, let's do this. Let's create a new console application. Now, in the real world, you could just run two instances of Rabbit Receiver. But in our case, we're gonna create a second receiver. So Rabbit Receiver 2 and yes.net7, and we come over here to rabbit receiver one, we can copy this item group out, go to rabbit receiver two, paste it in. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna show you a different way. Let's not put it in, in there. Let's come into rabbit receiver one, and control A and control C. Same code to rabbit receiver two. So let's just delete the code and paste it in. And notice I've pasted in this, and you know what? It didn't find this. So Sometimes when it knows what the NuGet package is, which it should know this, but evidently it doesn't, I didn't try it. Um, it doesn't know this, therefore it doesn't, doesn't know where to find this. But if it knows the NuGet package, sometimes it will bring it in for you. But in this case, it doesn't, no worries. We just grab this and then come back over here and actually come over to the uh, csproj file, save it. And now that should take care of everything. But we're not quite done. We're gonna say rabbit receiver two, and we're gonna process these a little faster. So this one, um, instead of time delay of five seconds, we're gonna say a time delay of, uh, let's go three seconds. It's not gonna process everything right away, but it's a little faster, right? Maybe it's a better server that's running on. 
Now, let's right click on the solution and say, uh, where is the, there's so many things in this menu. So we've got the startup projects. Where's the startup projects? Configure startup project, there we go. So we want multiple, we wanna start all of these. So now we hit the, the start button, all three are gonna open. Now we're gonna try and get all the windows on the screen at the same time. It's gonna be a little bit tricky, but we'll be able to see which ones are processing, right? So now we have three windows open. I have this one, I have this one. Let's bring us down here and I have this one. So we've got the two different, we got the sender over here on the right. We process 15 messages. On the left, we can see that the top ones process message zero, three, five, and eight, while the bottom ones process one, two, four, six, seven, nine, and 10 because of the fact that the bottom one is receiver two and it's a little bit faster than the top one. Therefore, it processes more messages than the, uh, the top one does. So that's our, uh, our application. That's how you can see that we're sending out tons of messages and we have two different receivers processing the messages without stepping on each other's toes. Notice there's no duplicates in the numbers. So we don't have a message 19 up at the top and down below. It's one at a time. If you look over here in our RabbitMQ management, you can see in the queue that we've got a lot of messages coming in. Right now we've got 30 total messages, 26 read, two um, unacknowledged, which means they're processing, uh, 25 in memory. So this will change over time. Now we're down at 23, now we're down at 20 because it looks like the, uh, the yep, the one process closed. So we're getting close to processing all of these messages with the two uh, systems. Let's go ahead and close the top one. And then we'll close the, the bottom one too, like so. And now we have uh, back to, let's go back to here and refresh. We've got 10 ready, one unacknowledged. So it's gonna end up back into the ready column. Um, there we go. So it was acknowledged, That's, I'm sorry, it was finished. So we have 10 left to do. We have got, um, we've processed 50 out of 60, we have 10 left in our queue. Um, so now we have two different receivers ready to process our system. Again, normally what you do is just take the executable for your receiver and put it on multiple servers or um, have it run multiple instances on one server, probably multiple servers though, because of the fact that the reason it takes so long is because it's waiting for specific resources, whether it's the CPU, the memory, the network, whatever it is, it's waiting on something. Otherwise it'd be instantaneous, right? So therefore putting it on multiple servers is probably the right way to go. So that's the basics of how to use the send and receive for portion of the message queuing system in RabbitMQ. In this, this basic principle works with any queuing system. It's the idea that you send a message to the queue, you then either are told there's a message there or you pull for the message. In this case, we are being told because it's a received event. So it listens and says, hey, you know, I've, I'm waiting for you to tell me this message is here. And you may ask yourself the question, what happens when you start up and there's already messages there? So right now we have 10 messages that are in the queue. So this application isn't running, but what happens if I start it? Well, when you start it, what happens is it says, hey, I've, I've created a connection to you. And it goes, hey, you know what? I've got stuff for you. And since we've said only tell you about one at a time, it says, hey, here's the next message. And so we process it with this event, this received event. And at the end, we acknowledge and say, yep, we, we took care of that. Then it says, hey, you know what? I've got another one for you. So it even replays the events if the listener isn't listening at the time when the message comes in. It's a very smart system. It's very resilient and it's capable of handling a lot of downtime on the receiver side where maybe you're you know, doing updates, whatever you need to do, you can have the server down and not really have any problems. Yes, it's going to not process those messages, which in the case of a signup might mean 
you know, the user doesn't get their email acknowledging they signed up or they don't get the welcome message or whatever else they normally get when they first sign up. But that's better than, you know, getting it late is better than never getting it or waiting, you know, while a server is backed up and crashes and they have to restart the data and try and replay it somehow from a database and it's, it can be a mess. So this way is super resilient. Now, I did say to come back to the, the idea of what about if you want to send data that's more complex than just a string? Well, in that case, what you do is, let's say you have an object where you have a complex object or even a list of objects, probably not a list of objects, probably one object. But if you have an object that has, let's say, first name, last name, email address, uh, date of birth, and a couple other pieces of information about it that you want to send via the message queue, well, then what you do is you would serialize that as a JSON object, which is a string, and then encode it as UTF-8 and send that. And then on the other side, you would get that message, you would decode it like we've done here, and then you would deserialize it back into an object. Okay, so that's that's what you do. It's kind of like working on API, where you API just send JSON data back and forth. Well, this is kind of the same thing, only it encodes it as a um, a byte array. So that's the basics of queuing. And again, we use RabbitMQ because it's a pretty popular open source system that lots of people use. It's also a great one to have running locally because as you saw, you can very quickly with Docker just get it up and running and start using it. Again, if you haven't figured out how to do that, watch my 10 minute training video on RabbitMQ because it's super simple to get going. It's just that one Docker command. So that's a, a great system for running locally and for testing and even in production. But there are other systems that you can use like um, Azure Service Bus, which is a similar queuing system. It still uses the uh, AMQP as a protocol, but it's um, in Azure and you can you know, use it in Azure to have the same type of processing system. So it's not just RabbitMQ is the only way. This is just one of the many queuing systems. You can even use something like uh, Mass Transit, which kind of, um, it, it kind of puts a, an interface over all the different queuing systems and allows you to use the same interface for, for all of that, which can be very helpful because of the fact that testing the, the Azure service bus is somewhat complex. There's not really a good offline system for testing or a cheap system for testing. So usually what you end up doing is using RabbitMQ for your testing system, and then you use Azure service bus for your actual live system, which isn't the best because of the fact that it's not the same thing. It's close, but it's not quite the same. So uh, Mass Transit can help with that. Um, but I just wanna show you how to get started with message queuing because it is a pretty important thing when you're talking about microservices. It's also an important thing when you're talking about making parts of your app scalable or more resilient to downtimes and maintenance and other things. So with that, I would love to know what your thoughts are on RabbitMQ, if you've ever used it or not. Um, if you're planning on using it, let me know. And also, um, if you need a source code, remember down the link down in the description, we'll get you that as well. Thanks for watching. And as always, I am Tim Corey.